Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for Dungeon Masters and guides for players. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are taking an in-depth look at our five favorite utility buff spells in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. The spells that we're looking at today are a little bit of a Swiss army knife of being able to be used possibly as offensive spells, defensive spells, or in exploration within the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. These are some very diverse spells that offer multifunctional capability in almost any type of adventuring situation, whether you are on the offense trying to escape or trying to navigate some interesting situations where your skills and intellect make all the difference in the world. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. As usual, we're listing these spells by spell level and not in any particular ranking or order. And as always, we tend to focus and favor the lower level spells in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition because they are used more commonly at more game tables. And in this episode, we've chosen spells of 4th level and lower. The first spell we're going to look at today is a second level transmutation spell available to bards, clerics, druids, sorcerers, and artificers, and that is Enhance Ability. Enhance Ability is a Swiss army knife spell with up to six different modes that you can choose when you cast the spell. It takes one action to cast. You touch a creature and bestow upon them a magical enchantment. Either the bull's strength, bear's endurance, cat's grace, Owl's Wisdom, Fox's Cunning, or the Eagle's Splendor. Each one of these six choices corresponds to one of the six main ability scores in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, and by and large, the effect grants the target advantage on ability checks associated with that ability score. The important distinction here is that this doesn't actually affect attack rolls or saving throws, but only ability skill checks. The spell lasts for one hour with concentration, but can be extremely useful for skill challenges. Yeah, casting Eagle Splendor on your party bard is going to give that character advantage on all of their persuasion, intimidation, and deception checks. Casting Cat's Grace on the party rogue is going to help them disarming traps and even sneaking up into the next environment. So each case, you can be strategic with which of these buffs that you choose, giving that character blanket advantage on all the ability checks that they're going to be making for the next hour. There's lots of ways to gain advantage on ability checks with things like guidance or the help action, but this is one of the only options for a blanket coverage for advantage on all sorts of skill checks relating to one of your ability scores. It can really make a big difference in situations where one of those abilities is at front and center in an exploration or skill challenge sort of encounter. Being able to get advantage without having to worry about the other party members helping or providing other spell slots to gain individual advantage on a case-by-case -case basis means that this spell is extremely dependable in that way. Enhance Ability is a spell that might require a little bit of foresight to use properly. If you anticipate skill checks that are coming and can anticipate the character who's going to need to do a lot of those skill checks, you can actually make it much easier for them using this ability. The next spell that we're looking at is a second level illusion spell, perhaps one of the most iconic illusion spells in the entire game. And that is Invisibility, which is available to a very wide range of classes, including the Artificer, the Bard, the Warlock, the Sorcerer, and the Wizard. The spell works very simply. You touch a target and that target becomes invisible for the duration of the spell, as well as anything they are wearing or carrying. The only way that they become uninvisible is either if the spell ends or they attack or cast a spell. Invisibility lasts for up to one hour though, as long as you maintain concentration on it. And you can target one additional creature for each spell level above second you use. So when you cast invisibility using a third level spell slot, you get two targets. And a fifth level spell slot will allow you to target four. This fact that you can target multiple creatures with invisibility at one time means that you can use the spell to set up ambushes, infiltration, as well as a great method of escaping a dangerous situation. 
It should be noted that invisibility does not give you advantage on your stealth checks, but instead makes it very difficult or nigh impossible for a lot of other creatures who rely on sight to be able to find you. You do still make sounds, which means that creatures can use their perception checks with hearing to try to locate where you are. But depending on the circumstances, this can be quite difficult. I like using invisibility on an entire party in tandem with situations where they're moving through open spaces where there's a lot of general ambient noise or distance. So it is focused on whether or not creatures can see you that matters if you're, if you're detected or not. Hearing doesn't factor into the situation at all. You can use invisibility in battle, but it's actually quite difficult to do so aside from setting up an ambush. It, it's much stronger as an infiltration method. If you are looking for something to use in combat, there is also Greater Invisibility, which is a fourth level spell and removes that option that you lose the invisibility if you attack or cast a spell, allowing you to remain invisible for the entire combat. Greater Invisibility only lasts up to one minute, as long as you concentrate it though, and you can't target multiple creatures with it, which makes means that Greater Invisibility is much more useful as a combat spell, and Invisibility is much more useful as a utility spell to facilitate those kind of ambushes and infiltrations. I also love using invisibility to help facilitate an escape, particularly if my wizard or squishy character is surrounded, becoming invisible and just running away is oftentimes all I need in the moment to get out of dodge. The next spell we're looking at is a great spell to pair with invisibility or use instead of invisibility. It's a second level abjuration spell for druids, rangers, and trickery domain clerics, and that is Pass Without Trace. Pass Without Trace takes one action to cast and targets yourself and lasts for up to one hour as long as you continue concentrating on it. Your companions and yourself gain a plus 10 bonus on dexterity stealth checks while the spell is in effect and leave no visible trace of your passage through an area. This makes you extremely difficult to detect and is a way of putting a mantle of stealth on your entire party. This is a great tool if you have a party that has some stealthy characters and some that are somewhat horrible at getting those stealth checks. A plus 10 bonus to a big clunky paladin or fighter might help them get past the guards and execute a great stealth operation. Pass Without Trace offers some alternative utility to invisibility because Pass Without Trace is still subject to the requirements of any other stealth check. You can see our entire video about the complications of that right up over here. Invisibility allows you to break the rules of stealth, but with Pass Without Trace, you still have to play by those rules. You're just getting an incredible advantage. Pass Without Trace is not going to help you if you're trying to sneak across a castle courtyard where there's nothing to hide behind. It's great if you're in the middle of a forest or trying to slink around a sewer or past city streets or other environments that are already ripe for using stealth in the first place. Another great use of Pass Without Trace is not only is it giving you that plus 10 bonus, but keep in mind that it also allows you to not leave any trail. If you have enemies that are tracking you through the woods, this is a great way to lose them. This is also why the two spells are really well combined together. Druids and rangers don't have access to invisibility, but bards, sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards do. So oftentimes if you have two members of these classes in your party, you can combine these spells together really, really effectively to make that invisibility even more potent when it's paired with Pass Without Trace, because with Pass Without Trace, now you're not leaving behind the telltale footprints that indicate an invisible creature is moving through. So if you really need that foolproof infiltration tactic, Combine these two spells together and you will get in without leaving any evidence of your passage whatsoever. The next spell on the list is a third level transmutation spell available for sorcerers, warlocks, wizards, and artificers, and that is Fly. Fly is a wonderful spell with tons of utility in both combat and exploration situations. You simply touch a willing creature and for the duration of the spell, they have a flying speed of 60 feet. The magical flight lasts up to 10 minutes as long as your concentration persists. Like invisibility, fly can be cast using higher level spell slots to target additional creatures. So a fourth level spell slot allows you to send two creatures into the air and a fifth level spell slot allows you to send three creatures into the air. 
This is actually pretty potent on its own in a combat situation, and casting Fly alone along with ranged attacks and spellcasters can be enough to steamroll a bunch of combat encounters, but it's, it's utility outside of combat that really makes Fly quite a special spell. In general, the ability to fly changes the scope of any battle or exploration that happens in the worlds of Dungeons & Dragons. As soon as your party has access to the ability to fly, things that were once large obstacles that were a challenge to get past now become very trivial objects that they can just fly over. A castle wall is a daunting task for a group of players trying to break into a castle unseen. But if they can fly, there's a lot more options. Or if they come to a large gorge that has no bridge across, a lower level party might be puzzled by this. But a party who has access to the fly spell and can cast it on multiple people in the party, this is no longer an issue. Now, of course, Flight does compete with some other spells like Dimension Door that offer some short-range teleportation, and there are other ways to gain Flight in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but it is often forgotten that this spell is available to 5th level characters when they first get 3rd level spells. And Flight is often something that we either think of as a racial trait or something that you need a magic item to get. And it astounds me the number of times players simply forget this spell exists, ignore it for many levels, when taking fly right away as a, your pick at fifth level or sixth level can have a massive and transformative impact on the game. In fact, the fly spell is at its best at level five and level six and level seven when access to these kind of abilities is very, very rare still in the game. It is worth noting that fly requires concentration, meaning that if you lose your concentration while you are flying high up in the air, you're gonna drop like a rock. It might be worth taking something like Featherfall to help out if that does happen to you. There are many high level options that can give your entire party flight under certain circumstances or conditions, but it doesn't allow your party members to continue using their own class abilities. If you transform into a gaseous form, like with the wind walk spell, your party members can't use all their own abilities. And the value of the flight spell is that you are not transformed. You still have access to all of your equipment and your full suite of abilities while you are in the air, and that alone is a benefit that cannot be understated. The last spell on our list today is a fourth level transmutation spell available to bards, druids, sorcerers, wizards, and trickery domain clerics. And it is one of our favorite spells in the entire game, and that is Polymorph. Polymorph is perhaps the ultimate example of a utility spell in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. It is such a diverse spell that it could be classified as an offensive buff, a defensive buff, a control spell, a save or die spell, as well as being a utility spell. This multifaceted dimension of the spell is part of what makes it such an overpowering and amazing spell in the game, and one that if you are playing one of these classes, you certainly cannot go without it because it is just such a good spell. This spell has a casting time of one action, a range of 60 feet, and you can concentrate on it for up to one hour. You choose a creature and you can transform them into another new form. An unwilling creature does get a wisdom save to try to negate the effect, but whether you want to choose a willing creature or an unwilling creature is up to you and will actually drastically change the use of this spell. The transformation lasts for the full duration of the spell or until the target drops to zero hit points or dies. You can transform the target into any beast with a challenge rating equal to the challenge rating of the target or the level of the target in the case of player characters. This is a very important distinction because what you transform a creature into is not based on your level or your challenge rating, but that of the target. So you can transform a level seven character into any beast of challenge rating seven or less or you can transform a challenge rating five monster into anything of challenge rating five or less. If you yourself are a level seven character and you want to transform a level 20 uh, character, you can choose basically any beast in the game. You're not limited by your own level. 
The target of Polymorph transforms into the beast of your choosing, and all of their stats are replaced with those of the beast, including mental ability stats. However, they do retain their alignment and personality. Their hit points are wholly replaced with the hit points of the new form. So if you transform a target with 50 hit points into a creature with 100 hit points, their original 50 hit points are just disregarded for the duration of the spell. If their new form is reduced to zero hit points, they revert back to their original form at 50 hit points with any damage carrying over into the new form. If the creature isn't reduced to zero hit points before the spell ends, but the spell ends in some other way, say the concentration is broken, any damage that they took while transformed is simply disregarded. So if you have 100 hit points while well, polymorphed, you take 25 points of damage, and then the spell ends because concentration is over, that 25 points of damage that you took just disappears into the ether. It doesn't carry over into your original form. Which also makes this spell incredible for saving a party member who's at very low hit points. Just giving them an extra 100 hit points by changing them into a stronger form is actually a great way to save them. While the creature is transformed, though, they are limited to the physical reality of their new form. They can't cast spells or speak, while they're transformed, they lose all their class abilities and powers and are basically playing as that monster from the monster manual while the spell is in effect. Their gear also melds into the new form and they can't use any of their equipment. Now, one thing that I have heard argued a lot with Polymorph is if you change into a Tyrannosaurus Rex, do you maintain the ability to differentiate your party members from the enemies? A lot of people say that because you lose your mental ability stats that you should be a little bit more ravenous or uh, attack party members. But I believe that the key phrasing here of being able to maintain your alignment and personality is actually enough to differentiate friend from foe. If we think of any common animal or pet that we may have, they can easily differentiate their friends from their foes and who they are aligned with and who they are not. This is something that will carry over even into a form like a Tyrannosaurus Rex or a giant ape. I would point out that forms like the giant ape and the Tyrannosaurus Rex actually have pretty good wisdom scores. And to me, being able to recognize friend and foe and have a sense of self and who you are in the world is just as much a factor of wisdom as any of the other mental ability scores. Now, of course, whether or not you can transform your allies into a Tyrannosaurus Rex is gonna vary on what your DM's rules on can you transform characters into forms that don't exist in the setting or not? Or do you require the players to have seen the forms that they're transforming their allies and enemies into? Which is a pretty reasonable restriction. It's also a pretty reasonable restriction to only be able to choose beast forms that you have seen or witnessed or that exist in the campaign setting. So a Tyrannosaurus and a giant ape might not always be an option for you, but there's still a lot of great utility in the polymorph spell nonetheless. One of my favorites is transforming people into giant eagles and then using them as flying mounts for a good duration of time because the polymorph lasts for one hour, long enough for an entire party to hop up on the giant eagle's back and get ferried across a difficult crossing. In general, Polymorph offering you so many different options for beasts that you can change into really comes into play in exploration of places that might require flight or underwater travel. There's so many options here to just negate the issues that you would have traveling underwater or having to get over large areas in a short amount of time. The utility of exploration that Polymorph offers cannot be understated. Yeah, you could transform an ally into something like a giant ape, and now they are a huge creature. They can move much larger objects, pick up much heavier things. They might be able to clear away rubble, or knock over a building, or open up a rooftop, or manipulate the environment in ways that they couldn't if they were a smaller creature. Furthermore, the giant apes can throw rocks at a pretty large distance, making them great siege weapons as well. Monty and I could go on about Polymorph for several hours because we absolutely love the range of options that this spell gives a party member and their ability to change into anything from the monster manual that is listed as a beast. It can be used in combat, it can be used in exploration, it can be used in any way that your imagination can come up with. And it can't be understated just how powerful this spell is. And we highly recommend that if you have access to the spell, you should look into it, take it, and try it out. 
That said, I will say that the offensive and defensive features of Polymorph have a much shorter lifespan than anticipated. Polymorph is at its most powerful from level 7 through to level 11, when the transformation options of the Giant Ape and the Tyrannosaurus really feel like powerhouses in combat. Starting around level 12, we have noticed that Polymorph's power as a combat buff spell really begins to drop off. It's still good, but not necessarily the best possible option. And this is when Polymorph enters its second life as a really fantastic utility spell instead. A place that it really takes for the rest of the game, particularly in high level play, when the beast forms that you're going to be transforming into really don't stand up very well in combat situations because of the fact that there just aren't any beasts with a challenge rating higher than 8. If in the future Wizards of the Coast does introduce more official beast monsters like a dire Tyrannosaurus or some sort of dire woolly mammoth or beefed up beast creature that is a higher level transformation from Polymorph, then its stock might rise. But because there aren't any beasts above challenge rating 8 in the core rules, we do see this drop off occur in the power of Polymorph. So this has been a look at five utility buff spells in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. If there's any that you feel we missed, tell us about them in the comments below. Of course, if you're enjoying our show, please consider supporting our work on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more videos covering the spells in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, including offensive and defensive buffs right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.